Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Startup Boston podcast, where I interview entrepreneurs, investors, and influencers in the Boston startup community to uncover actionable advice and stories from their experiences. I'm your host, Nick Dupuy. This is the 39th episode of the podcast and is slightly different from the previous episodes, and that's because I'm currently in San Diego. I came out here to visit some friends and decided to record a little San Diego mini series of the Startup Boston podcast. So there's going to be three episodes. This is the first featuring startups and investors in San Diego. I hope you guys enjoy hearing about and learning from three awesome San Diego founders, their companies, and a bit about the unique San Diego startup scene. So in this episode, I chat with Sumner Lee, founder of Fuse Integrations. Sumner was a pilot in the Navy, then spent some time in Spay War in a design consultancy before founding Fuse. Fuse is a design and engineering firm that brings warfighter-focused design to commercial and defense applications. In this episode, Sumner talks about their unique office space in downtown San Diego, where the walls are covered in murals, what he's learned from his time in the military and applied to running Fuse integrations, and the importance of focusing on users when designing products. If you liked today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes so you can get all of the new episodes as soon as they're released right on your podcast app. And as always, you can find today's show notes at startupbostonpodcast.com, and you can reach me at nic at startupbostonpodcast.com. Enjoy today's episode. Sumner, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here in you know, beautiful, sunny San Diego. And I have the chance to speak with you today. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me on. It's uh, nice to have you out here visiting. Thank you. So uh, to get us started, can you give us a little background about yourself? Sure. So I am a ex-Navy helicopter pilot that uh, has lived here in San Diego for some 15 years. Uh, went from flying in the Navy to working for technology systems uh, as in the Navy and then started a business, uh, my business called Fuse Integration. Uh, started Fuse in 2010 and uh, continue to ha- grow here in San Diego uh, for the last, gosh, seven years now. Do you still fly helicopters today? I haven't flown a helicopter in a long time. Uh-huh. I do get some time to fly some other aircraft, though. So fortunately, going through Navy training, you uh, learn to first fly fixed-wing aircraft and move on to helicopters okay. from there. And so I still get a chance to fly a little bit, uh, yeah. although, uh, yeah, not getting to fly helicopters in quite some time now. <laughs> Now, when you left the military, did you know that you wanted to start your own company afterwards? Yeah, actually, I went into the military knowing that eventually I thought that I would end up starting a business, running a business, doing something more like what I'm doing now. I had a great experience in the Navy. I went to the Naval Academy, flew, absolutely loved it, went into technology, uh, and then came into design and engineering that I'm doing now. I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs and artists. My dad started a company called Centurion Boats the year I was born. My mom was an artist who uh, has had artwork and jewelry in Saks Fifth Avenue and all sorts of different places. And so they both were real entrepreneurial in the way they approached life. I think I picked that up from my parents and knew that that's the direction I really wanted to go with my life. So uh, the Navy was an incredible experience and something that I saw as a stepping stone to really more being where I am now, which is uh, running and, and leading a company that's all about building things and doing stuff and getting the job done. Why did you get the idea for Fuse? So I started Fuse initially uh, as a way to bring better design ideas back into DOD and military systems. Uh, Initially started Fuse with a software tool as one of my uh, the founders had brought to the table. And we were going to use that software tool to build some creative network solutions and other software solutions. It ended up that it didn't really work out very well The Navy was not as excited about it as I thought they might be. So in 2013, we had a bit of a pivot and focused more on core warfighter-focused design and engineering, focusing on network systems, focusing on software systems, and have been really successful doing that. The original ideas for Fuse were to go and pull some of the more design-centric processes that the commercial world uses and pull those into some of the DoD programs and projects that I was familiar with, having flown and then worked at Spay War here, which is the Navy's technology arm. So uh, I really wanted to build on that commercial uh, design capability that is so prevalent in our iPhones and Android phones and other Mm -hmm. devices that you see in the home and the office. 
uh, realizing that there's a lot of value that that can provide for the warfighter, for the guys who are flying out over the middle of the Pacific or fighting in Iraq or Afghanistan and having to you know, be out there on the front lines uh, with our military. What are some of those design aspects that you wanted to take from the commercial sector and um, bring them to the, your defense contracting? So warfighter-focused design is what I really talk about predominantly with Fuse, and that is built on a lot of the design thinking concepts that you hear in the commercial design world. It's all about being able to empathize with the user, connect with the user, understand what the user really needs and wants and can do, and then putting prototypes and ideas in front of that user so that they can help shape the design process. So at Fuse, we use a design thinking approach to ensure that we bring the warfighter in as the user, whether it's the guy on the ground who's the forward air controller or the pilot in the jet who's up there having to uh, execute a mission or the command and control officer who's in the back of the AWACS or the E-2 uh, radar aircraft having to control uh, an entire battlefield. Uh, understanding what those guys need to be able to do their job more effectively helps us to develop products that help them do their job better. Mm -hmm. And so are they involved from the very beginning? Absolutely. So our process connects with the warfighter right from the front. Or on our commercial projects, and we've got more now uh, commercial projects as well, we connect with the user right up front, researching and understanding what it is the user needs to do, being able to, to get a good picture of what their pain points are as they're going through some workflow or mission flow or just some activity that's surrounding the product that we're focused on. Understanding what it is they really need and what they expect from the interaction with that product or solution, and then being able to improve upon that in the right places. You know, one of the things that I sometimes talk about is uh, looking at some of the programs and projects that are out there for the military that have excellent engineering behind them, but there's a lot of engineering for the sake of the engineer. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the things that I really try to focus on with Fuse is engineering for the sake of the user. Mm -hmm. Focusing on the end user rather than um, just trying to build a build a product and not Absolutely. worry about yeah. no need to build a better widget if the user needs something different. Yeah, and uh, you'll see products that get out there and they might do fifteen amazing functions, and the guy who has to use that device he only needed three things, and one of those three wasn't even addressed by this awesome thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, you've built the wrong product, right? Yeah. So we really try to focus on ensuring that that the user is right there at the beginning of the project and then continues to touch the project throughout, going through cycles of prototyping. And one of the things that we, we actually have a lot of fun doing it here in the lab is that we've got 3D printing and we do a lot of software prototyping and wireframing and uh, different design tools to be able to help people be able to envision what it is that they're interacting with and then what it is they're going to be able to interact with when we get to the production phase of a, of a product or a tool. So all of that, it's focused on being able to experiment with how the user will interact with the product is, uh, is a lot of fun for me. Is this um, different from what the end user is accustomed to? Are they used to just, this is the product and this is what it does, and then here you are coming in and, and actually bringing them through the whole process and putting you know, their feedback into it? So this is where I would say there's a real dichotomy between the defense industry and the commercial industry. So in the commercial world, you expect a product to be easy to use. Your Samsung phone has gone through tons of user research and workshops and work groups and, and people sitting down to understand how, so that Samsung can understand how you're going to use that phone. And in the Department of Defense, sometimes that gets ignored. And the guys who are out there on the ship who have to use a radio system or a computer system, sometimes they become an afterthought. And some larger program is paying attention to what the budget is saying and what Washington, D.C. is saying and, and trucking forward with some requirement. But the requirement has evolved so far that it's, it's evolved away from that ground user who has to actually end up with the product in their hand. And so I really try to lean away from that. And with all the projects that we're working on with networking devices and software tools for uh, different kind of communications and some radio systems. I really try to focus on who is it that's going to sit at the control panel and have to use this to communicate, or who is it that's going to be running around on the ground and they want to talk to the airplane that's up overhead providing support, or who is it that has to be able to communicate with each other and, and send secure messages back and forth. And mm -hmm. 
really understanding what it is they need to do in their job so that what we build isn't just some technology system that locked back in some cabinet, but it's something that they can utilize in their regular processes and make a difference in the job they're doing. Why do you think that other companies have strayed away on the, the government side from you know focusing on that end user? I think the government has strayed away from that quite a bit. I think large program offices get very much caught up in the engineering of what they're doing, and they drive uh, the large companies to to go down certain paths. And then the small companies, they do a similar thing, try to drive down a certain path. I think that there are a few different companies out there that are, are working towards similar type of goals of really focusing on the user, focusing on the warfighter. Um, I think it's becoming more and more accepted or, or at least talked about um, now than it was, say, two, three years ago. And I think that it's going in the right direction across the board. I, I, I like to think that we're on the forefront of that change and helping to affect that change at the leading edge. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I think overall, though, it is improving. And I think it's, it's a matter of momentum. You know, in government programs, one of the hardest things about running a government consultancy, a government contracting agent, you know, company, is that you have to work with the government contracting process, which is monolithic and extremely challenging and so slow that it causes companies to go out of business. And so having to work inside that with new ideas of how to bring in the warfighter it can be very challenging um, when you do break through and get things moving and get momentum going in the wrong way it can be a lot of fun and really rewarding but it can be challenging as well yeah now tell me a little bit about some of the products that you offer so we have a, that you've done. yeah we have a, an airborne networking product that is a, uh, a networking device this is uh, really on the geeky side of things where it's it's all about bringing computer networks into aircraft so that's a Navy project that we're working on there that's uh, delivering something that's significantly smaller than any of the competitive solutions, uh, as, as well as significantly less expensive, almost half the, uh, the price of, uh, of other solutions. So we've got a lot of interest from the Navy and then also now from the Air Force uh, about that. And it's all about extending the Internet, essentially the Internet, up to, uh, to aircraft. We've got another software product that's essentially a remote management and monitoring tools. So if you have ships or airplanes or vehicles that are out and deployed around the world, you can monitor them through the existing uh, internet networks and radio networks that we have. So you can be able to see your entire fleet of uh, systems, uh, how they're, where they are and what they're doing and how they're configured to be able to uh, monitor everyone and how they're working together. So it's Again, a fairly technical system, but it's essentially a software tool that lets you sit in a headquarters and see what everyone's doing in a high granular, highly granular uh, way. So you can see exactly how they're configured for doing some of the different things that they need to do for communications and for systems. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, one of our interesting projects on a commercial side is a, uh, a mobile application that's all about uh, building situational awareness among small groups and teams. So it's a map-based tool that lets you draw on the map, and everyone in your group uh, can see exactly what you're drawing. You can communicate with people in your group with voice and with text, okay. and uh, you can uh, also view video uh, throughout. And we're working still in a beta phase on that, so we're working out the kinks in the video, but essentially you can share voice, video, text, and then map live map markup between everyone, so you can... You know, I actually went to Legoland uh, a couple weeks ago with my family and a group of friends, and I thought, oh, man, I, I wish that I had given this, uh, given the app to all my, my friends and families that I was there with because there's a group of, like, 16 of us. And we thought, well, hey, where's everybody going? And, well, let's all go over to this ride or go see that. And I thought, man, the app would let everyone see where everyone is, and you could figure out how to get together more effectively and not lose people. Is that a commercial project that you're working on, or a that defense? is nope, that's commercial. a commercial project, and so um, that's using you know basic internet with uh, some security layers because you know you don't want to necessarily share your position with the world. Mm -hmm. um, using uh, you know commercial off-the-shelf uh, security tools that are you know, same that the banks use, and then uh, being able to put it onto iPhones, Android, and then also onto uh, browsers uh, for really focused more on first responders, firefighters, law enforcement, uh, those kind of folks, but then um, looking towards the future of how we might actually be able to, to uh, distribute it out to just regular commercial users. Hmm. 
Is that your first commercial project? Um, actually, that's our second. We have another one where we're doing a systems engineering for a uh, an in-home battery. So we are we are doing systems engineering, the core communications and computing power behind um, a system called Orison, and it's uh, essentially a competitor to Tesla's Powerwall. Okay, that's but the sort ask, of thing yeah. that's uh, that's the real differentiator is that it's plug and play. So you could essentially, when it gets to market, you could go to Best Buy or Home Depot and you could buy one, bring it home, plug it in, control it right there from your mobile device uh, as it's a, you know, on an IoT system, internet connected, and be able to uh, charge it if you have uh, solar cells on your house, if you have solar or other energy source, or you can also charge it from the grid and then control it to discharge back into your home uh, to be able to power yourself uh, with some independence from the, the power grid. What are some things that you've been able to take away from your time in the military and implement here at Fuse? So one of the things that I really try to implement here is building uh, a ready room or squadron type of atmosphere. So having been a naval aviator, I really found a lot of value in the camaraderie that the squadron would have, uh, the ability to motivate each other, and the ability to s support each other. So here... Uh, with our team, I try to build the same sort of an environment so that we have uh, an open uh, an open environment, open communications between everybody. We all like to work hard together. We ask hard questions of each other and, and drive people to, to work hard and, and, uh, and get shit done, as I like to say it. <laughs> and, uh, and then we also have a lot of fun together um, where we'll get together for happy hours pretty often. We'll go to a baseball game. Uh, we're right here downtown, so we can do some fun things together just right here in the, the local area down here in Maker's Quarter. Mm -hmm. Now, according to the U.S. SBA, military veterans are 45% more likely to start their own businesses. Why do you think that is? So that has been a really big question lately. Uh, I've actually talked to a lot of people about veteran-owned small businesses, the ex what appears to be an explosion of veterans into the entrepreneurial world. And I think that the military really teaches you perseverance. It teaches you how to overcome obstacles and it teaches you how to continue to work through adversity. And I hire a lot of veterans here at Fuse. We're about 40% veteran at Fuse actually. So it's fantastic. I'm working on projects with uh, Fab Lab and, and a couple of universities about building up a, a veteran uh, prototyping space uh, that we're trying to get put into place down here in Maker's Quarter that would be called MWorks. And uh, I think that the interesting thing about the statistics of uh, veterans in work and entrepreneurialism is just that they that you learn how to how to work through adversity you have to go on nine month deployments overseas stuck on a ship and you figure out how to get through it you have to end up going into afghanistan and run around in the dirt you get shot at you have to live in the, the mud you have to deal with some very challenging situations and you learn how to do that and you get a perspective that makes you realize that uh, you can get the job done as long as you put the energy into it. I think that's important because, you know, if, if you're starting a company and some child, you're faced with some challenge that's seemingly impossible, you know, you're not just going to give up. You're going to, you're going to continue to fight through it and try to beat it um, rather than just Absolutely. giving up and trying something else. And uh, I, I've got excellent employees who are both veteran and non-veteran. I've got excellent engineers who've been engineers their whole lives. And, uh, and I, I think they're both excellent. And one of the things that, you know, that I tried to take, I think I walked away from the military with is, uh, is the perseverance to, to realize that, Hey, I, if I run into hurdles, I can get through them. I can figure out a solution. I can create uh, a, a fix to problems that I might run into. What's been the toughest part of growing views for you? Well, one, being a government contractor has uh, definitely had its challenges with the timelines of uh, contracting offices and the administrative hurdles they put in front of you. Uh, that's definitely been challenging. It's challenging finding personnel. We're looking for RF engineers and we're looking for software engineers because we're growing and, and that's a challenge as well. There's excellent people out there, but always finding the right fit uh, is, is, if you want to find the right people, it's not easy to hire. Um, because everyone needs to fit together and, and both, you know, myself as leading Fuse, the rest of the Fuse people that we all work with and then the new 
employee. We all need to have a similar attitude and approach to life and business, and, and then we're able to work together. And, and it's just challenging to, to find the right people to fit together. Is the difficulties as being a defense contractor, like you said in the first part, is that part of the reason why you're starting to do commercial projects as well? Well, I think that I'm doing some commercial projects because I, I really enjoy these commercial projects, working with an in-home battery that can, it's a, it's a fairly forward-leaning project for us, but it's mm -hmm. as in it's some technology on the team that we're working with that is uh, pretty advanced and, and cutting edge. And so if, if the whole system is able to be successful and it's trucking right along, which is great, and, and starting to hit its milestones, it'll be a game-changing system. It'll be something that'll be awesome for being able to benefit both the utility as well as the consumer in their home. And some of the situational awareness tools, I think, are taking you know, ideas from how to manage and lead small teams and applying that to the commercial world. That's something that's actually really fun and interesting for me because I think there's a lot of value in it. So I'd say it's a mix of, yep, I'm uh, reducing my overall risk by diversifying a little bit, but then also uh, pursuing things that I have a passion about with the commercial projects as well. What would you say has been the largest mistake you've made so far running Fuse, and what have you learned from it? I think that a mistake could be my initial approach when we started Fuse, being too focused on a particular solution. And while I came into it thinking, hey, we're really focused on the user, I too much had some preordained solution in my pocket that I thought was the right direction to go. And I learned through that first couple of years that I needed to open up the aperture a little bit and really start to better understand what it is the user really needs and be able to go through more of that process of understanding and empathizing with the user. I think that I started out with the right approach, but the wrong execution. And so I think through our pivot and, and some of the redirect that I've been able to hopefully fix uh, that, that misdirection. What's been one of the largest drivers of your growth so far? Focusing on products, focusing on systems that really fit the need and being able to fit into that niche of, uh, of what it is that particular user needs. What does the future of Fuse integrations look like? What do you envision? So Fuse is building a few products right now, actually, that I think are going to help us with significant growth. Our airborne networking systems are going to save the Navy millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in savings from the current direction yeah. that the Navy is going. I think that by focusing on building out those products and continuing to refine them, make them better over time, making sure that we're staying ahead of the technological curve, I think that's going to help us grow quite a bit. I want to talk a little bit about your office now. Um, so most people listening to this won't be familiar with San Diego. So can you tell them a little bit about you know the section of the city that we're in and a little bit about your office space? Absolutely. So we are in what's called Maker's Quarter, which is a new development right in downtown San Diego. We're in an area that's a little bit more beat up. It's kind of on the fringe, really, of downtown, but it's still within the footprint of the primary downtown area, and it's really starting to grow. Maker's Quarter has a couple of new buildings going in, a new brewery that's opening up, another place called Punchbowl Social that's opening up next door. So... Our facility is actually an old warehouse in this area. So there's a lot of old buildings. And we came in, actually, when I first found this, I, I got to give credit to my wife, who found it online through some random posting and said, hey, let's go look at this place. It's a funky old beat up warehouse, but it might be interesting. And I walked in the door and it's hard to describe over the radio, I'm sure. <laughs> but I walked in the door and it really was a beat up old warehouse with piles of crap everywhere. But I could see through that because on every part of the wall was a huge graffiti mural. There were about 32 different graffiti murals throughout the entire space. Each one of them is about 15 feet wide and the ceilings are 20 feet tall. So you can picture this as you walk in. There's crazy artwork all over the walls, obscured by piles of trash. And so I was able to see that, hey, this would be an awesome place for a creative engineering firm. I really value the creativity of design, and I, I really value the create, creative thinking in all of my team. And so I knew that this would be something totally different than any other defense consultant agency that I've ever been to, and it would be a lot of fun to work here. So we stood it up with an open space, collaborative engineering space. We've got a, 
lab in the back with 3D printing and some mechanical engineering tools, a lot of electrical engineering tools. We've got uh, a lot of different collaborative type environments here inside our, uh, our funky warehouse to get everybody to think differently and work together. Do you know where the murals originally came from? Yeah, actually. Probably. So this, this facility, this particular uh, warehouse was the kickoff party and so they called it warehouse 1425 and it was all stood up as a party to celebrate the kickoff of maker's quarter of the development of this local oh. uh, six block area so they brought in a guy named chris who was the curator and he's done actually a bunch of beautiful murals all over san diego and he curated 32 different installations with different local graffiti artists to go and paint the entire space and they had a big huge party with a couple thousand people that showed up and uh, they celebrated the, the kickoff of Maker's Quarter. And then the place was unused for like a year and a half, two years until I, my wife stumbled upon it and drug me down <laughs> here and said, hey, check this out. And I said, oh, yeah, that's the one. That'll be great. What's your favorite mural? I actually think that here in the conference room, there's one that's kind of split between this conference room and on the other side of the wall and the outside. That's kind of your typical blobby looking graffiti paint thing and it has the the uh the name warehouse 1425 on it with a bunch of big drips i like that one and then i like in the back in the back room is a big face that's all multicolored it almost looks like it's wrapped in plaid saran wrap and it's this really funny kind of cartoon face but it's just very well done piece of artwork that's back in our, our shop area in the back now, before we started recording, you were telling me how you wanted to create a work environment that was different from the non-traditional contractor. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. So, you know, so much of Spay War uh, in, and Nav Air, for that matter, the, the Navy uh, technology development and aircraft development offices, they're drop ceilings and cube farms. And you see so many defense contractors that are drop ceilings and cube farms. And I said, no way. I am not going to have an office that has drop ceilings or cube farms. And so that played right into coming here. Uh, you know, 20 foot ceilings, they're wide open with huge um, skylights. We were flying a drone in here on <laughs> Friday, I think it was. Uh, the guys will fly different little quadcopters and whatnot, just kind of screwing around. It's all, I think that the creativity of the space and the artwork in the space helps to create a an attitude and an approach to work that's a little bit more creative. And so that's what I really value from all that. Why do you think this area of the city has been so successful with the new developments and attracting uh, new companies? Well, I think that it is a part of the city that's really focused on growth. And I think that it's a part of the city that's focused on growing the design thinking and the maker environment as well. You look at Maker's Quarter and it's really focused on design, engineering, creativity. And I think that there's a big area of growth going on in San Diego and Southern California for that. San Diego in particular, you know, LA is certainly known for creativity. San Francisco and Silicon Valley are known for software and technology. And San Diego, I think, I think is really going from being a beach town with a bunch of military to also being a very creative town. I think you've got things like the UCSD Design Lab that's now being headed by Don Norman, who was a... I, I think he was a founder or at least an early uh, employee of, of IDEO, um, you know, one of the, the basics of design thinking. Yeah. Uh, he's now is running the uh, UCSD Design Lab, and I think that you're seeing a lot of growth in design here uh, from UCSD to SDSU. And then also the military starting to pick it up more and more, I think, as, as companies like Fuse start to see the advantages of good design. I want to move now into our rapid-fire questions. So the first one is, what's another startup in San Diego that you're most excited about? So actually, I've got a, a classmate who's the COO or the chief people operations for a, a startup called the Honor Foundation. And I've been incredibly impressed by what they've done. They are essentially a veteran transition group. And it's a foundation that works on taking special warfare operators from the SEALs, from the Marine Raiders, from special forces into the Army and transition them into the commercial world, making sure that they have the tools and abilities to get a job after they finish their time in the Navy or Army or Air Force. And they have a program that is exceptional. It really teaches guys coming from the DOD how to go out in the commercial world and, and build a successful career and find the right path. And I've been incredibly 
impressed by what they're doing. Um, and I think that's a, a it's a fairly new program, and I it, and they're kicking butt. They're growing. Yeah. They've got classes uh, and programs that he, are going on here in San Diego as well as back east, and uh, and and they're exceptional. One of the other small businesses that I work with is Fab Lab, and uh, the Fab Lab San Diego is doing great things. We're putting together a, a project. We're trying to get a project off the ground called M Works, and uh, that's all about a, a maker space and a prototyping environment for military uh, veterans and DoD. And, and so, working with Fab Lab has been incredible. Katie Rast is the director here in San Diego, and she's just an awesome person who is so creative and so innovative. It, it's she's been great, and I think that that's going to continue to grow as well. And what's Fab Lab? Fab Lab is a called a maker space or a. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, fabrication laboratory. So it's a place that has a lot of 3D printing. It has circuit card design. It has uh, a wet lab for doing, uh, they've done some algae experimentation. And uh, it's basically an experimentation lab for fabrication. What's something about you that most people don't know? So this is kind of a funny one. I, I was warned that you were going to ask this question. <laughs> And uh, and one of the things that, that probably nobody knows is that I have a, a secret. I, I might be... Uh, I might be 40 years old, but I have a, a secret love for Legos still in my life. And uh, and I was kind of laughing to myself as I thought about this. I've got two young kids, two and a half and one year old who turns one next week. And uh, I am so excited for them to start playing with Legos. They're already playing with Duplo, the big ones. But I'm just a, I, I love Legos. I love building things. And uh, I'm excited to have kids and be able to be a kid again. Ah, that's exciting. What advice would you give your 20 year old self? Keep working hard. Make sure you focus on getting shit done and have fun while you're doing it. Outside of work, what do you look forward to the most? Living in San Diego is awesome. I love the beach. I love surfing. I love mountain biking. Right now, starting a business and growing a business doesn't let me do enough of that stuff, but uh, I really enjoy getting outside. I love taking my kids outside, too, and my wife. We have a a great time going to the beach and and going on hikes and doing things outside, so that's what I, Mm -hmm. I enjoy. I always, though, seem to have a sketchbook with me and Seemed that this weekend was uh, drawing for our new office expansion and figuring out some of the interior design and architecture, how we're going to build out the space uh, next door. But uh, Are you going to have more murals? We are, actually. We are. We're planning on a bunch more murals, uh, as much as we can fit in, at least. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of your favorite tools that will make your life and work easier? So here in the conference room that we're in, you can see that I have whiteboards plastered from floor to ceiling on half of the walls here. And then if you, uh, I'll, I'll take you back into the rest of the lab here in a little bit, and you'll see we have a 14 foot tall whiteboard, 14 foot tall whiteboard. We've got whiteboards everywhere. And I think that whiteboards and uh, whiteboard markers are one of the best tools that I have uh, to be able to communicate, uh, express ideas and, and share ideas with people and, and also learn from other people as you get to all erase whatever you're drawing and fix yeah. it and change it. And, and uh, that's one of the, the tools that I love. What are some of your favorite blogs or books? I don't read enough right now because I'm working too much, I think, but um, I really enjoy Inc. Magazine, I think actually has some good articles that are pretty good for small businesses. I really enjoy Communication Arts. It's a it's a design magazine, but okay. I love all of the visual and design things that come out of it. And then recently, I've been reading a couple of the uh, the Bill O'Reilly books. Killing Patton was a great book. Uh, inter- all very interesting story about um, General Patton, uh, the end of the war, how he was instrumental in winning the World War II in Europe. And then recently, I just finished Killing the Rising Sun, which was all about World War II in the Pacific. And um, it was interesting. I've never been much of a student of history, and so it was very interesting to read a little bit about uh, some of our history at a pretty pivotal time in America. Just a few final questions here to close out. So where can people find out more about Fuse Integration? Best place to find out about us is probably just online. Fuseintegration.com is our website, and uh, we've got some information on there. You can contact us straight through the website, so that's pretty easy. Mm-hmm. That That's usually the best way to, to get in touch with us. And do you have any parting thoughts, advice, or suggestions for the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that I think is really important, and I look at myself and my own career, I look at the, the folks that I work with here at Fuse and, and then also with other companies and agencies that I work with, and I think that I, well, I personally have a lot of fun with what I'm doing, and you seem like you have a lot of fun with what you're doing mm-hmm. too with this blog and everything else that you're doing, 
And I think that it's so important to find that in your life. And sometimes you hear people say, oh, I hate my job. I don't like what I'm doing. And I think there's no need for that because there's so many great things out there yeah. that if you focus on what you love and you work hard at learning that thing and then doing that thing, that you'll be successful in what you do. And there's no need to have a job that you don't love because there's something out there you can do and that can support your livelihood and that you can be doing what you love. We'll end there. Sumner, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Great. Thank you very much. It's been fun. Thank you. If you liked today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. You'll get all my new episodes as soon as they're released right on your podcast app. And if you really liked today's episode, it would mean a lot to me if you could write a review of the podcast as well. Just go to startupbostonpodcast.com slash iTunes. And remember, you can find all show notes with links at startupbostonpodcast.com. Until next time, if you have any feedback, ideas for guests, or just want to say hi, you can reach me at nic at startupbostonpodcast.com or reach out on Twitter at startupboscast. That's startup B-O-S cast. Cheers.